Michelle Marie McGrath. Hi, and welcome to Unclassified Woman. And today I'm delighted to be talking to Therese Schechter in Brooklyn, New York. Therese is a filmmaker, writer, and multimedia storyteller. Her work fuses humour and personal storytelling to disrupt what's considered most sacred about womanhood. She's currently writing and directing My So-Called Selfish Life, an in-progress documentary about women who choose not to have children in a culture where motherhood feels mandatory. Her previous documentaries include How to Lose Your Virginity, about the myth and misogyny around our most precious gift. She also curates the interactive crowd-sourced story collection, The V-Card Diaries, which was recently exhibited at the Kinsey Institute. Her films, including the award-winning documentaries, I Was a Teenage Feminist and How I Learned to Speak Turkish, have screened in festivals, college classrooms and on television from Rio to Seoul to Istanbul. Therese's work has been covered by The Atlantic, Salon, Elle, Jezebel, The Guardian and the Jakarta Globe, amongst others. In her spare time, she co-hosts Downton Gabby, a podcast discussing media by and about women. And it's a bit of a longer episode today because Therese just has so much to share. I could have talked to her for hours and I'm really looking forward to my so-called selfish life coming out next year. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation and I'm sure you'll agree there are lots of gems in here. Enjoy. So welcome to Rees. So great to have you here today. Hello. Great to be here. Thank you. And really looking forward to hearing more about your background and of course about your work. And so just to give us some context, can you share um, a little bit about yourself and whether you've not had a child due to personal choice or whether it's been a combination of circumstances? Sure. Yeah. So, um, I'm, uh, I lived in New York city. I'm in my fifties. I'm married. Um, and, uh, I, the, the quick answer is I don't have a child due to personal choice. I don't want children. I don't have children. So it's great. Um, I was, uh, very vocal about this apparently in high school. My mother says that I told her that I wasn't going to have kids when I was in high school and that it was going to be my sister's job to give her grandchildren. (laughs) Um, So that's, that's where my head was at as a teenager. But as I got older in my twenties and thirties, I somehow assumed I would have kids anyway, even though I didn't want them Mm. because it just felt like the thing that you're supposed to do. And all my friends were doing, and I didn't know anybody who like was vocally saying, I do not want children. So it was a strange time in my twenties and thirties in that way. And we can talk more about that later. By the time I turned 40 though, um, I realized that, you know, I, I didn't have kids. I probably wouldn't have kids. And I had dodged a really major bullet. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where I sit now. And I think what you mention is so common in that we really are conditioned to that assumption that, yep, I will just do that. That will probably happen. And especially when we're in our 20s and we're still kind of looking forward, um, it's really, I don't remember it ever being discussed as something that was an option for me not to do that either. But I always remember questioning um, and feeling quite resistant to that assumption that that's just what you do. And I remember questioning that, you know, to myself often and also to my mum, like the same as you really, when I was fairly young, thinking, but what if I don't want to do that? What if that doesn't happen for me? What if that's not for me? So 
that sounds very similar to what you were questioning at that time. And so what were some of the beliefs that that brought up for you to explore? Like when you were at that point where you were thinking, okay, well, I probably will do that. Did you have that little voice inside saying, but I don't really want to? Oh, yeah, all the time. In fact, uh, my sister is a great example. She's a wonderful mother, um, and she's always wanted to be a mother. And I knew that I didn't have even an ounce of that feeling that she yeah. that she had since she was quite young. Uh, I'd never really wanted to be a mother. I didn't know if I would be a good mother or not, but I it just wasn't something I was very interested in. Yeah. So it's a very strange space to live in where you know that you don't really want to do something and you don't really think it's going to make you very happy. And yet there's this inevitability that you'll do it anyway, mm. which is, a, uh, I think, the way many, many women um, Most, I think. move through life. Um, so, you know, I think my whole life has been this kind of struggle with what I felt like I should be doing and what I really wanted to do. And, and a lot of that had been around, you know, marriage and children and how to sort of construct a career and things like that. Um, I didn't even really want to get married uh, yeah. because I never thought I would meet somebody that I would really feel happy and comfortable with. And, uh, you know, I didn't get married until my mid late forties when, uh, I finally found that man, lucky me. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an ongoing thing in my life. And I think other women's lives too, where we understand that we're supposed to be following a certain kind of script. Yes. Um, uh, that is kind of shaping our identity or at least what the outside world thinks should be our identity. And I think that we're always wrestling with that because we don't always want to be that person. Yeah. Um, even yeah. though we feel like we're supposed to be. So it was, it was quite liberating at 40, really, when I was sort of taking stock of my life uh, to figure out, oh, you know what? I don't want to do those things and I don't have to do those things. And um, it really, really changed my life to, to come to that place. And did you feel any pressure from your family and friends at all? Or were they quite accepting of your decision to not go down that path? Unlike many, many people I've spoken to, I did not get a lot of pressure and I did not get a lot of, you know, what we call bingos. Yes. Um, you know, those those phrases that oh, everyone, yeah. you know, hears. <laughs> you'll change your mind. You, yeah. you know, when you meet the being, right person, you'll sure. feel differently when the baby's here. Exactly. Yeah. You know, every woman wants children, you know, that that kind of thing. I didn't really get too much of that. The, the stuff I mostly heard was about getting married. <laughs> yeah. And again, not from my immediate, my immediate family has always been supportive. I've been very lucky. Um, but I think you don't have to hear it from your family or even your friends. We are so steeped in a culture of this, yeah. again, script script that women need to follow and you know every women's magazine yeah um every you know tv show all of it sort of talks about how you every woman wants a husband it's also so heteronormative but that's yeah. another story every woman wants a husband everyone wants kids if you don't have a husband you're going to be sad bitter lonely etc so honestly, if my friends and family never even uttered a peep about what they thought I should be doing with my life, it was all around me anyway. Yeah. It was impossible to avoid and was with me from when I first started, I think, um, consuming media. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, so often when we go to the movies, um, well, firstly, it's rare if the leading you know protagonist is female and then usually she's looking for love or she's upset because you know she's lost her love and what will happen and it's it's not usually like she's on some quest um 
focused on something <laughs> else. It's all about getting the man, having the baby. You know, these are the co- the common themes that we see replicated over and over again. I mean, it's starting to change slightly, but it's it's just so unconscious. It's endemic, isn't it, in our culture? I think so much of this people are not e- do not even realise they're being brainwashed by these stereotypes all the time. Well, I'll tell you the the thing that really um, affected me greatly in figuring out what I really wanted in my life was feminism. Yeah, I in my late thirties, I got more involved in in feminist um, circles. I started reading more feminist media, um, and it really changed everything about the way I looked at my life. And I actually, my first documentary was called I Was a Teenage Feminist, which was about trying to reconnect to the 13-year-old girl (laughs) that was a feminist and trying to reconnect to her at the age of 40 when feminism was a really dirty word. Mm. Um, When I was 13, I I saw Free to Be You and Me. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. It was an American. So everyone... Everyone needs to experience Free to Be You and Me. It's from 1974, I want to say. It was a TV show, a TV special, and it was also an album. And it was done by Marlo Thomas and a bunch of other people. And the whole show was songs and skits and animation and all kinds of things that were basically encouraging kids to be who they wanted to be and who they really were. And my favorite part of that show was a retelling of the the story of Atalanta, which is a Greek myth. Um, And I'll just tell you very briefly, her father wants her to get married. She's the princess. She needs to get married. He organizes a road race. (laughs) That's really how you find the best husband. And, And all the men of the area were invited to run in the race. And she said, okay, fine, but you have to let me run in the race also And if I win the race, I don't have to marry anybody. (laughs) And so this is a a change from the original Greek myth, which is like pretty heinously sexist, but we won't go there. Yeah. Um, But in this (laughs) version of it, you know, she she actually ties with this young man uh, and they tie. And the the king is like, well, since you tied, you get to marry my daughter. (laughs) And the the young man says, uh, I would never want to marry your daughter if she didn't want to get married. So, you know, good feminist young man. Um, <laughs> and so what happens is they become friends. And then he goes off to explore new lands across the sea. And she takes off on horseback to learn about new lands and things. And they both go their own ways. And we don't know if they ever get together in the end, but we know they lived happily ever after. Yes. Yeah. So this blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, that that was a possibility. <laughs> it absolutely blew my mind. And it, it really like defied all sort of fairy tale conventional wisdom yeah. that that could happen. And I think that's what made me a feminist, honestly. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I, I talk about that again in I Was a Teenage Feminist in in, in trying to reconnect back to that feeling. But that's how I was as a teenager. That's yeah. what shaped me as a teenager. And then it was lost. You know, it was just yeah, lost. that's right. The teenage years when you then start to have all these hormones going on and you start being compared against mm-hmm. other people at school and then we start feeling insecure and we really kind of lose and forget that confidence and enthusiasm that we had as a younger child. Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of it. And part of it was just being a teenager in the 1970s yeah, and then becoming a young woman in the 1980s where the political climate changed completely. There was this huge backlash to mm. feminism and the ideas that it had brought with it. Um, and, uh, you know, your world really changes and you lose a connection to the things that gave you strength. Um, so. Yeah. And so, so that's great. So that was then your the first film that you made. And so what then really lit the fire for you to say, okay, that's it. I'm going to make the documentary that you've got obviously coming up soon, My So-Called Selfish Life. What was the push that made you go, I'm definitely making it about this topic? 
Well, it's interesting because it's a topic I've been talking about for a long time yeah. with like with like minded friends and uh, a few people who have been working in this field and writing about it for a really long time. And we, we've we been talking about it for ages, but I never felt like it was sort of a public topic that I, you know, that was getting discussed. And um Quite recently, there has been this real outpouring of mm. personal storytelling around not wanting children, you know, in the yeah. last five, six years or so. Yeah. Of course, people have been doing this for much, much longer, but I think it reached this critical mass um, where where people really started telling their, their stories. And with it came this huge backlash and conversations about the backlash and how people were made to feel yeah. when they admitted this thing that had been impossible to admit for so long. Um, and it really got me questioning why, why is it so horrible to say, I don't want children? Yeah. You know, why? And this goes back to sort of the theme of all my films, honestly, is, is I, I, want, I want to disturb what we think is most sacred about womanhood. Yeah. You know, all of these assumptions about womanhood that are unassailable, that you're not, you know, and one is that womanhood and motherhood are inextricably linked, that the female identity is completely bound up in being a mother. Exactly. When it's just one expression of it. And of course, it's important, but... Equally, there are other experiences and it's just not possible or relevant as the path for every woman to experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that seems so logical to me, yeah. but, but it's not, it's not, it's still not really accepted. And what I wanted to do was really go beyond all of the name calling yeah. and the, you know, um, just making women feel like they're freaks. Um, I wanted to, to push beyond that and really look at the sort of the, the cultural, the economic, the historical forces that make this possible, that, that say a woman's true identity is, is as a mother, a woman's true value is as a mother, yeah. to the exclusion of everything else. Yeah. So where does that come from? Why do we believe this? How is it steeped in our popular culture, but also our economic policy and, um, you know, our history and our media um, and and figure out, you know, where did this come from? Talk about pronatalism, for yeah. example, you know, which is a very insidious thing that people. It really I, is. You know, it's like the water we swim in. It's like patriarchy, you know, explaining patriarchy you know, this social system that gives men power, basically, um, is not something you really notice because you're so used to it yeah. uh, until until someone points it out and says, did you ever wonder why women took men's last names? <laughs> you know? And well, it's um, just about ownership, isn't it? That's what it means historically. Right. I mean, it is It is this idea that, yeah. you know, men, men were the owners of all of their chattel, including their wives and children and whatnot. But, yeah. um, you know, they're like large social systems like that. So that's really what I wanted to talk about. I like making these documentaries that, you know, take an idea and sort of hold it up like a, like a prism or a crystal, you know, and you can look at all the different facets of it and, and understand how it all came to be and what it means. And, create some some recognition of what our world actually looks like when yeah. we sit down and, and take the time to pull it apart a little bit. And so while you've been in that process of bringing all of that information together, have you discovered anything that actually really surprised you? Well, there are a lot of things I learned, you know, I, I knew my own experience and the experience of my friends, but in making this film and in um, spending time with the women who are profiled in the film, you know, I learned all about, for example, the desire to be sterilized and how yeah. difficult that is for women. Um, that's a story I didn't know about until I started working on this film. Um, another aspect is... Um, the idea of regret, having children and regretting it. There is a woman yes. in my film who um, talks about that. Um, and I don't think I've ever actually seen that on film before where people are, this woman is um, not hidden or anonymous. You know, she talks about it openly. Um, 
those, those things I didn't really know or understand until I started exploring it. Um, the whole process of fertility treatments, the yeah. fertility industrial complex, and how really it's in their interest to convince every woman she has to have a baby at any cost. It's a business. It's a huge yes. business. And there's a woman in my film who went through years of fertility treatments uh, until she sort of took stock of her life and realized that she was trying to have a baby for everyone except herself and is now quite outspoken about the, you know, the tactics that fertility industries employ. Now, the thing about the fertility industry is it's, it's helped many, 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 many people, including some of my very dear friends have children. Yeah. So it's not that these things are just inherently evil. It's that you have to go into every situation understanding what you personally really want and need. Yes. And really think about it. Really have the opportunity to think about it. Um, and really understand that people are trying to sell you stuff. The media is trying to shape a certain way of life. Um, our religious institutions are also sending us messages. Completely. Our, our cultural groups are sending messages. I know that um, with, with sort of my own cultural group I grew up with, you know, having kids is really important. Yes. Keeping, keeping the, the line going, keeping the families going. The family is the center of everything, which is, which is fine if you're allowed to look at it and say, I understand, but I still don't think it's for me. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. It, I think one thing that's really important for me in making this film is that it's not a film about how terrible motherhood is. It's not yeah. a film about how people are tricked into being mothers. Um, it's really the idea that we have different paths in life that we can take. Yeah. There really are different paths open to us. And our society really just presents us with one path. They're like, this is what you do. This is what you're supposed to do to be normal, to be accepted in society, to be successful, to be accomplished, to have value. Um, and that's just absolutely not true. So I think that's at the heart of it is just yeah. understanding that, that there's more than one path in life and kind of understanding why, why we believe there isn't. Yep. And as you say, I mean, just thinking back, really, I don't remember ever having a discussion about that being just a choice and not a foregone conclusion. And I don't remember ever seeing really any positive role models of women without children for a very long time. You're depicted as like um, Baron Spinster, the crazy <laughs> cat lady, um, yes, the I selfish, <laughs> kind of bitter, twisted, um, craggy old hag. I mean, it's the evil stepmother, like, you know, so that's, I mean, that obviously that's a whole other topic as well about stepmothers. <laughs> So, I mean, it's just not something that's ever portrayed in a positive light. And then even when we see in film sometimes, if somebody's considering that, often then it will be that, oh, you know, in the end, it all worked out. They met somebody, they had a family, yeah, they all lived happily ever after. That was just an aberration, you know. So we just don't see, or we're seeing, you know, we're starting to see more emerging now. Um but again, it's just, again, it's, it's so sort of deeply embedded in our culture and society that it's just there are these certain perceptions and pressures that we're constantly subjected to as women to toe the line. And, and as you say, just follow that one path. We don't see that there's a whole heap of other stuff available. Right. And, and, and the other part of that, I think, is that we're not allowed to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and we have found this with the with the Me Too movement and sexual yeah. assault. As soon as we feel that we're able to talk about our experiences, everything changes. Yes. Yeah. And and I think to to a degree, it's the same with this idea of having children or not having children, wanting them or not wanting them. As soon as we can start talking about how we feel, 
it makes all the difference. You realize you're in a community. You realize you're not a freak. You're not alone. There are other people who feel like you do. And I just, I just, uh, so Canadian author, Sheila Hetty just wrote a book called motherhood, which yes, is a I've fictional book, that. right? I want to read it. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting a lot of publicity now. It's, it's very exciting, but I read an interview with her recently and she had this quote that just stopped me in my tracks, which is, I just wish that more of us would tell, sorry, I'm going to start that again. I just wish that more of us would tell the truth about our lives. So we didn't all feel so lonely. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That is a biggie, isn't it? That's basically the crux of so much. Yeah. It just, it really stopped me in my tracks and I just thought, I was like, Oh yes. Yes. That's right. Um, one thing I do love though, um, is the, the idea of crazy cat lady being embraced, which is wonderful. (laughs) You know, the idea of being a spinster, being yes. embraced. Yeah. Um, this is, a, this is a, a lovely thing where we're like, I know you think these are bad words, but actually they describe my life, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think, exactly. That, was, it's, it's true, isn't it? But we've kind of, you know, we've, we've really been brought up to believe that these are very kind of negative traits and... I mean, I know so many women who have got nieces and nephews who absolutely adore them, love spending time with them, but it doesn't mean that they want their own. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure. you know, it's not, I've never heard of anyone who's a kiddie hater. You know? <laughs> but oh, then, uh, I've met a few. <laughs> you know, I've never, I've never sort of, well, I've never really come across that. But again, that's another one of those projections that mm-hmm. often it'll be, oh, well, don't you like children then? It's like, well, it's not that at all, you know, but again, it's, this is a, so deeply embedded in the, in the conditioning that we have. Right. I mean, I would say, I mean, I have certainly, I certainly met people and heard from people who really don't like children, but I I have to tell you, they're not all child free. (laughs) There are a lot of of parents who only like their own children (laughs) and not like anyone else's children at all. Um, And, uh, you know, some people don't like other people. Some people prefer the company of animals. I think that's okay. Uh, I, the people who don't really like being around children, um, should definitely figure out a life where they don't have to be around children. You know, um, it's just, to me, it's another one of these things where like, oh, you all hate children, which is like, if you used to say you were a feminist, it was like, oh, you hate all men. Yeah. It's like, no, but you know, if you keep treating me that way, (laughs) I might. Absolutely. Um, so, but I, you know, I have two nephews and they're, you know, completely awesome. <laughs> Again, thank you, Andrea, for having children. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there are other children who I really love. I, I'm not a person who loves being around kids generally. Uh, you know, some people get on their hands and knees and they start playing with kids right away or, or they were like babysitters in their teens or all of that. And that's really not me. I, I really, I love teenagers. Um, I love young adults. I love, I love people at a point where you can like have real conversations, you know, things like that. I don't, I don't relate too much to little kids. I'm not particularly good at it. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody's different, aren't they? And it's just Mm -hmm. recognizing what isn't, isn't right for you really. And, and, you know, as you mentioned, just about being honest about that. And I think really about us all being just much more tolerant and accepting of people's choices and wanting to support women in having agency over their own lives and bodies, whatever that may look like for them. Right. That's the, that's the ongoing mission, really. Yeah, it really is. And so, would you like to share with us when your film will be out and available for us all to see? Do you know yet what the date's going to be? So we have a projected date. Okay, so my dream is to release the film on International Child Free Day. Brilliant. August 1st, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 29, awesome. 2019. So next year, next year on uh, International Child Free Day. So that's my, that's the date I keep in my head. 
which is August 1st, 2019. Um, we're almost done shooting. We've already started editing. Making documentaries is a long process. Yes. Um, so it's a little hard to know. Um, one factor always, and this is every independent filmmaker ever, you know, is raising money, is raising yes. money to keep production going. So um, we had an amazing Kickstarter. We raised $46,000 almost Brilliant. in the fall, which was great, which really, you know, covered all of our shooting and some of our editing. Brilliant. Uh, but we ne- we will need to keep raising money for that. So, and people can support us through the website. Yep, um, I'll share the link to that in the post that goes with this. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we have amazing supporters and we've built up a big, big audience at a point where, you know, we're, we're still, you know, deep in the work. Um, so that's really, that's really great. Well, it but just yeah, shows people- that the interest is there. Yeah, it's incredible. I've never had such an engaged audience on any project I've worked on. Um, What does that that tell you? (laughs) Oh, that tells me it's worth it. Exactly. It's it's definitely worth the the years and, um, you know, expense of of making this film because, um, you know, people need it and want it. And I'm really, uh, I just feel really glad that it's something I can be working on and doing. So. Yes. So important. So do you feel with this, this is really your way of, yeah, engaging with your purpose and your vision for your life that you're really living it and sharing these stories of women? Uh, Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, I I had a different career and I, (laughs) that I was really successful in and I left it to go to film school and make documentaries like a complete idiot. I don't know what I was thinking. (laughs) Um, It's really hard work. It's really, really hard work. Uh, But it is really meaningful. And I think that the kinds of films I've been making, which really have forced uh, conversations out into the open about things people don't want to talk about. um, Absolutely. So important to disrupt all of these rigid boxes that we don't want to be in. Yes, of disrupt. I need to use the word disrupt because it's completely you know, well. That's exactly what you're doing, isn't it? With all of yeah. these projects that you're working on and sharing, all of these films. And so, how else would you say that you express yourself creatively? Do you feel that you express that fully through your work, or are there other things that you do that you enjoy? Well, when you have the time and you're not busy editing. <laughs> I like singing show tunes. Oh, well. um, <laughs> I don't have a great voice, but I really like belting out, you know, I can't say no from Oklahoma <laughs> when the mood hits me. Um, uh, I do a lot of little things. I bake. I, um, I've been uh, doing paper engineering, which is just basically making pop-up cards. Oh, really? Uh, wow. Yeah. I've been making some feminist pop-up cards. Um, and, uh, some other little projects like that. I, I think that, um, you know, being a filmmaker takes up a lot of time. I don't feel like I have a lot of, a lot of free time, but I really do love my work and I love what I do. And when I can carve out some time to do some other things, it's, it's great. But, um, I always think about how, you know, how people with children, live creative artistic lives because it is so all encompassing. Yeah. And I know that if I had actually, you know, met someone in my thirties, you know, and married and had kids because I felt I was supposed to, I wouldn't be doing any of this work now. Mm -hmm. I would never have been able to go back to school and take these enormous risks, you know, to move to New York, to not make any money, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do it and I would be doing something else and I don't want to, you know, aggrandize myself, but this work wouldn't have happened. So I do feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Absolutely. Um, And there must be a great deal of satisfaction in that. Yeah. And, you know, I forgot that (laughs) the thing that I also do a lot of is graphic design because that's what pays the bills. 
So <laughs> I do, I do well, have a whole graphic design business. creative as well. Yeah. It is. It's, yeah, that's what I've been doing my whole life, actually. Um, so I do graphic design. I do write from time to time. Um, I do a podcast. Um, yeah, I do a so lot of stuff. So pretty busy actually. then, hey. Pretty, I'm pretty <laughs> busy. Yeah, I'm pretty busy. But, you know, it's funny because some people, you know, have said to me, oh, this is how you're expressing your your mothering, you know, instincts, you know, by creating all these other things or by nurturing people with your work. And I, I really soundly reject that yeah. characterization that I don't think everything grows from a motherly instinct. I think it, you may have instincts to teach or to nurture or yeah. to create. Um, men don't get asked about their fatherly instincts. <laughs> well, that's know? a very good point. That's very true. They don't yeah, I mean, do that. You nobody, would just wouldn't say that. It's like you wouldn't say, are oh, you a, you know, a career man? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. These things fall apart really quickly when you change the gender. Yeah. It just sounds ridiculous. And as soon as it sounds ridiculous when you address it to men, you know that it's ridiculous when you address it to women as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah, it is funny. It's interesting how, how that works with language when we interchange like that with gender. Absolutely. It's, it's a real eye opener actually. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, are you expressing your fatherly instincts by, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, being a teacher, sir? You yeah. know, <laughs> it sounds sort of crazy. Yeah, um, that's, it's, that's so true. Cause it's interesting that you say that because conversely, I've heard women use like say, Oh, I feel that I'm mothering my students or I feel that I'm, you know, birthing. So it's interesting how mm -hmm. that language, um, it really resonates with some people, but then for other people, it just doesn't resonate at all. You know, so again, it just highlights the ridiculousness of so many of these stereotypes and that we really do need to take into account that there are just so many variables and preferences in each person's life. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you feel like, like your mothering instincts come out as a teacher um, or as a, a nurturer of some kind, that's, that's great. That's, that's great. I just don't want to be painted with the same brush yeah. as every other person yeah. out there who, you know, has a uterus, for example. Like, exactly. it just doesn't make any sense. It's so much easier, isn't it, though, to just put people in, in a little box and, you know, yeah. that's your that's your box. Um, but I've, I've actually had, had arguments with people about this. I almost lost a friendship over this. By really? somebody insisting to me that all of the work that I do making films and art and, you know, I, I do a lot of screenings in colleges and, uh, you know, answer a lot of questions online uh, for young people. And, and they wanted to wrap that all up in some kind of mothering instinct that didn't come out by having children, but is coming out here. And I said to her, I don't have any mothering instinct. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that's, that's not what this is about. Mothering instinct is not my baseline. My no. baseline is a curiosity about the world and a desire to make the world better in some way yeah. and a desire to have these conversations. And some people, for some people that might then create a desire to mother. Yeah. But that's not where it comes from. So again, just because I have a uterus, does not mean that everything has to be ascribed to some sort of sorted maternal drive. Yeah. So yeah, I get, totally. <laughs> I get, I get pretty firm on this because it's, it's something that I think it also promotes this idea that every woman in some way has to be a mother. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, totally agree. I think you're so right. So have you got any words of encouragement that you'd like to offer other women who are maybe struggling with the decision to be very open about the fact that's not their path and that's not what they want if they're feeling a lot of pressure around them to conform to that? Yeah, and, and I want to take a step back actually and say that, you know, for all the women who have not yet figured out what they want in life, have not yet decided whether they want to have children or not, you know, ambivalence is fine. It's yeah. okay to be ambivalent. 
It's okay to not be sure. Um, it's a gift to have the time to think about it, Yeah. to shut out all the noise and really, really have a conversation with yourself about what you truly want and what you truly need, um, independent of all these other voices around us. Mm. Um, I think that's so, so, so important because then when you understand what you need, then you can follow that path. Um, also, I think that we change over yeah. time. I think I, one thing that I've actually, I found very surprising and then not surprising at all is women who thought they really, really wanted children when they were say 30. And by the time they're 40, they're like, I guess I'm not going to have children. And I guess that's actually okay. Mm. You know, which is, which is something I hear a lot, um, both from people who are, um, by choice or circumstance don't have children yeah. by the time they reach an age where childbearing is going to be a lot more difficult, if not impossible, they're like, yeah, you know, it didn't happen. And I, I did really want it, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's fine. Um, I have a lot of benefits in my life because I didn't actually end up having children and, you know, things like that. So, but I guess what I really want to say is you're really not alone. And yeah. I go back to that idea of telling the truth about your life. Um, you're not alone. There's a really big community and there's a really big community of people who don't want kids can't have kids or do have kids that all are supportive mm. of this. So it's not just women who don't want kids supporting other women who don't have kids. It's, it's a much, much bigger community than that yeah. because ultimately we all have people in our lives that are making those choices. Um, so, so there, there are people who are going to support your happiness and, um, the people who don't support your happiness, I'm very sorry about that. And I hope that through conversation, they understand. And I hope through projects like mine and, and many other people's um, books and films and podcasts like yours, uh, people just get a better understanding of what this is all about and open their minds to the possibilities that yeah. are before us and that are unlimited that would be nice if they were unlimited. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean like I, as in unlimited choices for our lives really if we you know it's not just one set path that we all have to go down the same road I mean how boring would that be without yeah. economic equality we have far less choices yeah. so you know, people who who can't control their own fertility because of either financial issues or government policies or mm. many, many other ways that women's lives and bodies are controlled. Um, we need to fix that. Yeah. Absolutely. People who can't make choices because of their own sort of cultural ideas where they can't choose for themselves what they want to do. Um that's another problem. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a wonderful idea to keep in our brains that we do have choices and we don't just have one path. We also have to really recognize the limitations in women's lives right now yeah. that keep them from exercising those choices, even though they know what they want. But it's yeah. getting better. I think it's getting better and we're getting more vocal and we're getting more vocal in a lot of different communities too. And I think it's really important that those of us who are in a position to be vocal are on behalf of those who don't have a voice. That is essential. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, one of the things that's been really important in the film is to not make this a white woman's conversation. Yeah, yeah. Because there are very different conversations around having or not having kids in other communities. Um, and, you know, just for example, in African-American communities where women's reproduction was tightly controlled and has mm. been since, since um, transatlantic slavery, um, the attitudes towards choosing not to have children in some ways is like playing the white person's game yeah 
and helping the white person win, you know, and this is a complex subject that I'm really very excited to, to unpack in the film. But, you know, just keeping in mind that not everyone has the privileges that yeah. I personally have. Yeah. And so we really have to be working to, um, you know, allow, allow everyone to have that level of control over their lives. Completely. And you're so right. I've been speaking to a few women of color actually on interviews, like in the last week. And it's been really interesting to hear their perspective about that. And of course, varying whether it's childless or child free as well. And just one of the things that I found really interesting that a few people mentioned was how you know, religion is brought into it much more. That's what they said when they compare discussions being had by their white friends on the same topic. They say that often it's religion that's voiced much more as an underlying theme as well. So mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Like I want to learn more sure. about that. So sure. it is, it is, it's just, it's so complex, um, as you say, rightly. And it's just, it's such a, a fascinating and yeah, multi-layered, multifaceted area. Uh, it is endlessly fascinating. And when you're on a project that takes, you know, five years to finish, it's, it's the perfect kind of project, which is endlessly fascinating and endlessly revealing new aspects of yeah. the topic. Yeah, that so, I'm sure there must be right. so much that you didn't anticipate when you started that's just continually revealing itself. Yes, I'm 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 now looking for an expert on the biological clock to tell me what the hell that's all about. Well, that's I'd love to know more about that. I've actually yeah. read a few things over the years where the general consensus seemed to be that that's a bit of a myth. Yeah, but absolutely. then then some women say that they really do feel that urge. So again, it, we just can't have a blanket um, approach for everybody because everybody's different and got different factors. So, but it's yeah, that is uh, that's a fascinating one. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's you know why do some people have this urge and other people don't? You know why do people have it and ignore it? Yes. Um, there's a lot, again, there's a lot wrapped up in it, um, you know, to do with your period of fertility ending and feeling like you have to make some choices and that creates this kind of urge that something has to happen. And then, you know, again, from the thousands of people literally that I've talked to, the idea that if you ignore it after a while, it just kind of goes away and shuts up. And what does that mean? Right. So right. I'm sure, though, you'll find, yeah, quite a lot of differing perspectives on that when you're, you know, talking to experts and doctors about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, there's uh, one of the women in the film is a gynecologist. And um, this was the most contentious part of our uh, trailer is when she looks at the camera and says the desire for children is not innate. Mm. Um, it just isn't that's, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, this is the one thing in our trailer that I got the most pushback on people right. saying, of course, the desire for children is innate. Everyone wants children. And I'm like, no, really, <laughs> it's not. And, and what that's saying is if you don't want children, it's not that you're abnormal. It's just that you don't want children yeah. because it isn't, it isn't an innate desire. Well, it's certainly not for every woman. Again, like we just can't, um, you know, we can't make that generalization. It's just not true as we know, you know, personally. So that's going to be a really fascinating area to explore. And I'm sure there's going to be some very heated dialogues around that. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I love that. I want to talk about it. So mm. send your cards and letters and emails. Um, I would love to to talk more. We've had some conversations on Facebook, which have been interesting. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, I bet you're saying interesting in inverted commas as well. There. <laughs> you know what? I again, it's talking about it that yeah. is so important. Yes. Um, we're not going to always agree, but yeah. the fact that we're having the conversation instead of keeping it in the shadows, yes, is is the thing that's important. 
absolutely crucial. No, that's so good and so great that you are creating all these conversations through these very, very much needed projects. So that is brilliant. So can you share where people can find out more about your work and yeah, can keep in touch with you and find out when they're able to view the documentary once it's finished next year? Yeah, absolutely. So the best place to go in terms of this film, My So-Called Selfish Life, is our website, which is myselfishlife.com. And through that website, you can contact me directly. Uh, You can get links to our Facebook page, which is a really active, fun page. Um, We've been publishing stories from women, first-person stories. We have a whole bunch of clips that you can watch. So a lot of it is happening at myselfishlife.com. You can also sign up for our newsletter, which I promise I will not bombard you with emails, but you will be kept up to date on, on what's going on. And if we're releasing a new little clip or something, you'll get it. Um, and then generally for the rest of my work, you can go to trixiefilms.com, which is my main site. And that has links to all of my, uh, writing, podcast, interactive stuff, and of course, films. So that's trixiefilms.com. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I've absolutely loved talking to you and I could talk to you about this all day. Thank you for listening to Unclassified Woman. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. For information on events and services, connect with Michelle at michellemariemcgrath.com.